about this room, unfortunately one of them is we don't really have a mic system, so just have to bear with us in that regard. Uh, I'm Glenn Boots, and I'm professor here and director of the Forum for Citizenship and Enterprise, which is hosting this lecture. And uh, before I forget, if you can take a minute and uh, silence your uh, devices so those don't go off during the lecture, that would be appreciated. As you know, part of our programming this year has commemorated important anniversaries. We've had a lecture series on the Great Society of 50. That concludes on April 20th. I hope you'll be here for that. We actually won't be in here. We'll be over in Griswold. That's April 20th at 7 p.m. Tonight, we commemorate an event that, though 150 years distant in time, continues to excite the imagination and the remembrance of our nation, the Civil War. Or if you're like me and you spent any time in the South, the war between states, the war of northern aggression, or the war of southern independence. When I first went down there, that was a bit of an eye-opener for me. Just in the last two years, we've seen the war or its constituent subjects revived in award-winning films, such as Lincoln. Uh, for 12 Years a Slave, which was actually published before the war, but of course slavery and the Civil War seemed to go together in the American mind. Publishing on the war seems as fresh as ever. There's a new book coming out by James McPherson, and uh, of course maybe the biggest seller related to the war in many years is Bill O'Reilly's book on Lincoln, which again, not necessarily about the war, but again a constituent subject. You don't have to go far to find men and women willing to devote much of their free time and money to even relive this era, and you can go down to the Civil War muster in Jackson and see what I mean. Now, Americans continue to debate the causes and the legacy of the war, but no one would debate its significance. Part of the significance is owed to the statesmen and commanders who determined its course, including larger than life figures, such as Ulysses Grant, who later became president, and Robert E. Lee. To help us reassess and understand these men, we have with us tonight William C. Davis. Mr. Davis began his career in editorial management in the magazine and book publishing industry. He left in 1990 to work as a writer and consultant both here and abroad. In 2000, he became professor of history and executive director of the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, a position from which he retired in the fall of 2013, and he comes to us from Blacksburg today. He's the author and editor, author or editor of more than 50 books in the fields of the Civil War and Southern history, as well as numerous documentaries and screenplays. He was the on-camera senior consultant for 52 episodes of the Arts and Entertainment Network History Channel series Civil War Journal, as well as a number of other productions on commercial and public television, and also for the BBC, and has acted as historical consultant for several television and film productions. His book, The Battle of New Market, provided the basis for the motion picture Field of Lost Shoes, released in fall 2014, and his book, The Pirates Lafitte, The Treacherous World of the Corsairs of the Gulf, has recently been optioned for a projected Franco-American joint production as an eight-part miniseries. Unfortunately, it's not a reality TV series. <laughs> a deal instantly. He's a three-time winner of the Jefferson Davis Award given for book-length works in Confederate history. Now, when you think of all the studies written about the Civil War, you can't help but recall what Yogi Berra once said about a famous restaurant, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. <laughs> Thankfully, even though the field is quite crowded, some still dare to go there. And what could be more crowded than studies of Grant and Lee? Yet, Jack Davis has gone there in his latest book, Crucible of Command, Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, The War They Fought, The Peace They Forged, is currently the selection of our faculty book club here on campus. The Wall Street Journal called it brilliant and balanced, well-paced, and a history buff's dream. The Roanoke <coughs> Times said of it, the use of fresh primary sources distinguishes this work from that of the romantic, rhapsodists, and caustic critics 
whose careers are focused on perpetuating the myths that surround the lives of these two West Point graduates. The History, Club, History Book Club has called it articulate, provocative, and persuasive, and Civil War Times called it fresh, bold, and irreverent. Mr. Davis is also a member of the advisory board of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and serves on several other consultant bodies. And those of you who watch police dramas will be intrigued to learn that he's an occasional consultant to Virginia State Police on cold case homicides. <laughs> We're pleased to have him with us tonight to reopen the case of Grant and Lee and the history they made. Please join me in welcoming. song from Law and Order in the background. Huh? Now, can you hear me at the back? Right? If at any time you can't just raise your hands, then it's too damn bad for you. <laughs> it's wonderful to see this room this full. Uh, I retired from tech two years ago, and I had a classroom about this size, and I never had anywhere near this many of my students show up for any class, as you all have tonight. That's really wonderful. This may explain some of the highly intended things they turned in on their papers. Uh, what was my head's full of them? Uh, Abraham Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address while writing to Gettysburg on the back of an envelope. <laughs> Those of you who have studied grammar have spotted it. I guess it was the first term mail. Uh, a late friend of mine, Bell Wiley, a great Southern historian who uh, was at Emory University for a great many years, used to collect things like this. I have not. He had a whole collection of things just about Lincoln, which has nothing to do with my talk, by the way. These things just occurred to me, and you're now stuck with them. Uh, but we are, of course, approaching another anniversary on April 14th, the, the death of Lincoln. And some of the things students turned in were just, just marvelous. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves by writing the Emasculation Proclamation. <laughs> and that was freedom of the sort, I suppose. <laughs> um, Abraham Lincoln was, he was, Abraham Lincoln was killed on April 14, 1865, when he got shot in his seat. <laughs> by an actor named John, by a supposedly insane actor named John Wilton Booth. Oh no, the, the supposed assassinator. <laughs> Not assassin, but assassinator. But think about it, what do you call a man who shoots someone in his seat? <laughs> the supposed assassinator was John Wilton Booth, a supposedly insane actor. This ruined Booth's career. <laughs> We are in the midst of, a, of an anniversary, a sesquicentennial, which my students thought was a province in Canada, <laughs> that's been observed in a variety of ways, or not observed, as the case may be, across the country for the last four years. And it's been a time of, of reassessment, reawakening, revision, as we, and in a way, I think, far more useful than what took place 50 years ago during the centennial, which I'm sure all of you remember. <laughs> that was a pretty embarrassing enterprise, all told. Uh, what's gone on this last, this 150th anniversary, what has been done has mostly been done well and has generally been pretty successful. <coughs> 150 years ago today, what is today, March 31st? Yeah. Yes. Okay, nothing happened. <laughs> 150 years ago today, Grant and Lee were about to meet each other in the final week of the war for them, certainly at least for Lee. And it's, it's an appropriate time to look back, I think, at these two characters. This, it may surprise you. At that moment, in 1865, Grant and Lee are the two most popular men in America. Grant is far more popular in the North than is Abraham Lincoln. 
in fact, there's a, there is an extremely vocal, uh, to some extent violent, opposition to Lincoln throughout the war. Even within, within his own party, there are tremendous divisions. Lincoln is fighting a two-front war, one against the Confederates in his front and another against his opponents, not only in the Democratic Party, but even within his own Republican Party. <coughs> But Grant is universally popular. He's the war's genuine, real, original article hero. South of Mason and Nixon's line, Robert E. Lee is vastly more important than Jefferson Davis, as he will remain to this day. Uh, hands up, everybody who has a picture of Jefferson Davis on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> Davis is reviled. There are those who think he is intentionally losing the war for the Confederacy. One man, Robert Barnwell Rhett of South Carolina, all the crazies come from South Carolina, <laughs> actually will say that Jefferson Davis was born for his work as Judas was born for his. <laughs> Davis has betrayed the Confederacy. But Robert E. Lee is already a living legend in the South. To the point, this mythology is fascinating stuff, and the way people try to associate themselves with it, to embrace it, to the point that within just a couple of years after the end of the war, Confederate soldiers who served in what was called then the West, which is that region between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River, or even the Trans-Mississippi, that area west of the, of the Mississippi, even Confederates who served out there, and never set foot in Virginia one day during the war, will eventually manage to retroactively replace themselves in their memory so that they fought under Robert E. Lee. They have an emotional and psychological desire to associate themselves with the man who gave the Confederacy about 90% of the good news that it did get during the course of the war. So these men are not only icons in our history as we look back on them now. But they were icons in their own time. What I'm going to do now, I'm not going to tell you the whole life story of them or fight all of their battles. That would take probably 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> but instead, I want to go over with you some aspects that, of the men you may not have thought of or may not have known about that may give you some understanding of why they were who they were why they became who they became, and why they still to this day remain who we want them to be. That's not necessarily the same thing as what they were. Their pre-war lives, I won't go over, very briefly, both went to West Point. Robert E. Lee graduated number two in his class. He never got into merit his whole four years at West Point, but every single year, he stood behind one other cadet named Charles Mason. Hands up everybody who's heard of Charles Mason. Nobody has. He graduated top of his class and resigned, which you could do in those days. Lee was always number two to Mason. Lee was not, contrary to mythology, the only West Point cadet ever to graduate without garnering any demerits. You know what demerits are? If you were caught off the post, you'd get some demerits if you were out of uniform, that sort of thing. It's a very popular myth about me. It's not true. 26 other cadets graduating with him also had no demerits. But he was an exemplary cadet to the point that there was a demerit book that you can still see it today in the archives at West Point with a page for each cadet with his name across the top. And his demerits during his four years would be listed on that page. <coughs> Somewhere around Lee's third year, he still hadn't gotten any demerits, and someone at West Point decided, we're wasting a page on this guy. So they crossed out his name and wrote in another cadet's name. And that guy got demerits. They knew Lee wasn't going to get any more. He was an exemplary student. Ulysses S. Grant was not an exemplary <laughs> student. He reminds me a great deal of, well, my college career. He never let studies get in the way of a good time. He got demerits. Not a lot, but he got them. 
He did all right in some of his courses. He never failed anything. He never excelled at anything except mathematics and horsemanship. If there is such a thing as a horse whisperer, Grant may have been one. All accounts from his youth agree that he had some remarkable, almost otherworldly connection with horses. That they seem to understand him, or he, they, uh, I don't know what language they spoke, and it's immaterial in any event. But horses were very, very close to his heart all of his life. He graduates in the middle of his class, actually just below the median point. They both have careers in the old army. Grant, of course, leaves in 1854, becomes a businessman and a farmer. We will stay in the military right up to the moment he resigns his commission in April 1861 to go and join, to take command of the Virginia State Forces, not Confederate forces. Virginia has seceded and has its own, essentially, National Guard, and he becomes Major General in command of that. Only when Virginia joins the Confederacy do Lee and the Virginia State Militia then go into the Confederate Army. Both of them, Grant and Lee, have interesting ideas about loyalty. And they're unwavering ideas. For Grant, there's never any question in his mind. His loyalty is to the United States of America and to the Constitution to which he took an oath when he was given his commission. Lee took that same oath to that same Constitution but like so many in the uh, southern states, he would feel a tug of loyalties when this business of secession came around. Keep in mind that at the time the Civil War begins in 1861, Virginia has been around for 254 years. It's older than the Union by far. You, can, uh, you may be able to kind of project yourself into that situation to realize that a loyalty to Virginia can actually antedate and perhaps take precedence over loyalty to the United States. Still, he was deeply conflicted, not about resigning his commission and going over to the Confederacy if he had to. He, he made that decision by December 1860. If Virginia seceded, Lee knew he would have to resign because he could not accept and obey any order that would tell him to lead troops into Virginia where he might have to come face to face with friends, family, former comrades. So his anguish wasn't over that, but he was anguished about the fact of severing a connection with the U.S. Army, which had been his life, his career, it had been his home for more than 30 years. It was a very, very difficult, extremely difficult challenge for him to have to face. Both Grant and Lee recognize something that often, too often, generals don't recognize. And this is not unique to Americans. It's just something that's sort of in the military mind or the minds of some of the military throughout time. They understood that in a constitutional civil democracy, the civil authority was supreme. Neither Grant nor Lee will ever challenge, as a general, the civil authority they serve. The president is not just the chief executive, he is commander-in-chief. The army is subordinate to the civil authority. There have been many instances in our past where some generals didn't accept this, including in that war. George B. McCullen in the north, of course, uh, who goes by the nickname Little Mac because he's only about this tall. Uh, he was never called Big Mac, that's for sure. <laughs> McClellan could not get his head wrapped, his enormous head, wrapped around the idea that there was any authority superior to himself. And will be a constant thorn in, Lee's, in uh, Lincoln's side until the McClellan is essentially taken out of the war. On the South, Jefferson Davis will have the same problem with a few generals like Joseph E. Johnston or P.G. Pierre Gustave Beauregard, one of my favorites. His name is Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard. 
But he doesn't want to go by Pierre because he thinks that sounds too foreign. So he has friends call him Gustav. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's like a pilot. He's not really tall enough for all that name. Uh, and he does not recognize any authority in the land superior to himself. He, like Johnston, will fight with his president, Jefferson Davis, throughout the war. Lee will never challenge his president, even when he disagrees with him. One of the frustrating things about Lee, in fact, is that we know very little of what he actually thought of Jefferson Davis. Because he conducted himself as he thought a general should, by keeping his opinions to himself. On the other side of the lines, <clears throat> Grant will never challenge Lincoln. And in fact, of course, they wind up thinking virtually identically by 1864, so there's, there's no reason for a challenge. It is interesting to see how Grant deals with issues when laws are passed or edicts issued that he might disagree with. Grant's not entirely sure about the Emancipation Proclamation. Grant will become a champion of emancipation and the freedmen in time, but in the early years of the war, he had, seems to have no real mature concept about how slavery should be dealt with, whether it's right or it's wrong. He then kind of is different to it. But he will say, I will execute every order I am given by my commander in chief, whether I agree with it or not. If ever a time comes, when I cannot with good conscience obey an order, it will be incumbent on me to resign. And he expected that same thing from his subordinate officers. You don't have to like what Lincoln does, but you have to do it or resign. It's a very mature attitude that both Lee and Grant will have toward their status and the status of the military in this stratified civil democracy. <coughs> Excuse me. Lee doesn't challenge his government. He mainly focuses all of his attention on his army. He does, however, contrary to the notion that Lee's apolitical, he does, however, kind of allow opinions now and then to escape him that touch on rather hot political matters at the time. There was no hotter political issue in the Confederacy during Lee's, during his life than the proposal to enlist free blacks or slaves in, in Confederate arms. Uh, this, I think, probably still blows the minds of most Americans today. Why on earth would a slave want to fight for the Confederacy? And despite this nonsense that's currently very popular, that there were tens if not hundreds of thousands of Negro soldiers in the Confederate Army, it ain't so. It just was not so. But they did have a notion in Richmond, a few people did, that perhaps blacks could be enlisted if there were a promise of something better for them in return for their service afterwards. It's going to have to be clearly freedom, but the Confederacy could never go far enough in his mind to make that promise. But Lee realized, how can you ask a man to fight for you and then return him to servitude? There was going to have to be some kind of a quid pro quo. He will, in fact, be one of those who are arguing for some sort of limited emancipation at the end of the war. His notion being, if we don't use our slaves to fight for us, the Yankees will use them to fight against us. Of course, the same position is, why should they fight for the Confederacy at all? What if they just wait? They'll be free when the war is over. That issue never really gets settled. The troops don't get raised. But it's one example of how Lee could sort of venture an opinion in the political realm without ever stepping into it. These two men are not revolutionary leaders. They're not men of big ideas. They're not big thinkers. I don't mean they're stupid, not that at all. But they don't concern themselves with man's place in the cosmos. They're not really concerned about this sort of thing. They're, they're fairly down to earth men. Grant, 
is a simple man of very complex instincts. Lee, I think, is a more, a more complex man who still is very much in touch with the down to earth. And they're not revolutionary soldiers. This may sound odd since these are regarded as among the greatest captains in our history, but they're not revolutionary soldiers. If you look at what they do during the war, they essentially practice all of the lessons and do all of the things that they and hundreds of others were taught to do at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. This is not to say that generalship is not a sophisticated craft. It certainly is. But it's not rocket science. Lots of generals will try to do the same things exactly that Grant and Lee will do, but they will fail because they don't have some indefinable spark that those two do have. What's different in the way that war is going to be fought, what's different in the challenges that face them, is not new ways of fighting war so much as the scale on which they're going to have to fight this war. The war with Mexico, I've forgotten the numbers now, I think the entire United States Army involved was 40, 50,000 men, something like that, in two different armies in Mexico. U.S. Grant at one time will, point, will command 120,000 men in just one army. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia will achieve almost a strength of 100,000 men in late 1862. No one in the hemisphere has ever seen military commands of this size. And when you think of it in its totality, it is a daunting prospect. The enormity of that machine and all of the ancillary things that go along with it. You want to put an audience to sleep, talk about logistics. But without logistics, armies don't move. A man eats maybe a pound and a half of beef a day. How many tons of beef does an army of 100,000 eat in a day? Multiply that into a week, into months. How many thousand wagons do you need to have being pulled by tens of thousands of horses and animals? And all, how much are those animals going to consume just to get goods to the point where the army can use them while carrying their own food along with them? It is an enormously complex task. And they're not taught to do this. West Point, then, is a school to produce engineers. That's all it's interested in. If you graduate from West Point in that period, you get one class in military strategy and tactics. And you get it in your senior year. They're not interested in that. They're interested in how to build walls out of stone and brick. It's a training ground for engineers, which is why the top students always go in to the Corps of Engineers. They get no experience, no training in a pretty important thing at this university, management. They learn it by doing it. Fortunately, Grant and Lee both have good instincts for that. It may help. Then in the war with Mexico, Grant was a quartermaster. So he had overlooked supplies, things like that, just for his regiment, which is just a few hundred men. That's nothing like the scale of an army of 100,000 or more. But at least he understood that all of the fodder that goes in, all of the oil that keeps that machine running. And Lee understood it very well simply from having been in the military for so many years. Both <coughs> showed what can't be taught, that they had an instinct for this aspect of command. And I can't tell you where it comes from. I can only tell you that very few other men who had exactly the same background and training as they did not have it. And they have one other thing. They have the character to deal with the responsibility of all of that. Responsibility is a horrible thing. I've been responsible for, I'm 68 years, I've been responsible for seven or eight of those 68 years. And it's, it's dreadful. You all will learn this one day. But imagine not being just responsible for yourself, but responsible for the lives, the pay, the clothing, the equipment, the arming, the training, the leadership, the deaths and the maiming 
of hundreds of thousands. That is a mind-breaking responsibility that very few people are equipped to handle. And you can't teach that either. It's somehow miraculous. I can't explain it. That both of these men had it in spades. It's perhaps just the luck of their respective nations. How do they lead? What are their management styles? For a start, they have a grasp of the notion that the man at the top can't do everything. How many of you in here are studying management? How many of you are learning anything about management? Okay, pretty much the same way. One of the things you'll learn very quickly in any kind of management is that you can't do it all yourself. And if you try to, you're not doing a good job. Delegation, delegation, delegation. It's amazing how many generals of the Civil War era, North and South, could not do that. Why? Reasons you've probably all heard from other people in other contexts. If you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. Or, I can't trust somebody else to do it as well as I can. And maybe if you've been let down once or twice by supporters, I know I can't trust them to do it. It's the inadequate manager, the insecure manager who feels he or she's got to have a finger on everything to make sure it's not all falling apart. Grant and Lee don't have this problem. Again, probably just luck of their characters. They understand how to delegate. Now, Grant does a better job than Lee. Grant, in time, by the end of the war, will develop a staff, which is really the precursor of the modern general staff. Uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, an army commander, by regulation, was supposed to have maybe five staff members. One a quartermaster, one a commissary, meaning one an ordnance officer handling artillery and ammunition and all that sort of thing. Grant, by the end of the war, will have a confirmed staff of more than 20 everyone a specialist. So that when Grant makes his plans, he simply can tell each of his specialists, here's what this operation needs from you. You see to it. I don't need to talk to you anymore, do I? Here's what this operation needs from you. I need good maps. You're my topographical engineer. You will make my maps. And they will be accurate, won't they? You know, the most wonderful story about Civil War maps, they were all terrible. <laughs> There was a, a Union general, I love his name, Alexander von Schimmelfeng, yeah. good Scots Irish boy, who was trying to take a fort in South Carolina. And he drew his own map for his men to find their way to where they were supposed to go, and then he sent them out. Well, they came back, not having performed their duty, their job. And he said, Why didn't you do what I urged you to do? And they said, Well, we went out to where the map said to turn left, but it didn't. The road turned to the right. The map's all wrong. And Sewell Fenwick says, no, by God, the map is right. It's this country that's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lee will develop a decent staff. He'll have seven or eight by war's end staff officers. But pretty much by all accounts, he doesn't use them as effectively as he could have. There's a lot of complaining during the war about Lee's staff work. It's not the fault of his staff officers. He was not employing them quite as, as efficiently. He could have had more. He simply felt comfortable with that number. And it's hard to fault him in many ways when you see what he managed to achieve. But these are the first generals in American history to develop anything approximating the modern concept of staff work as a vital managerial tool. Secondly, they don't hold something called councils of war. The famous lunatic, Stonewall Jackson, once said that councils of war do not fight. The more men you get together in the general's headquarters to talk about should we do anything, the more a kind of collective hesitance will set in and they'll talk themselves out of acting. 
Lee and Grant both do exactly the same thing. I mean, they're virtually identical in this. They will consult their specialists. They'll consult their generals. How do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? What do you think you can do? Then they make the decision by themselves. And they live with it. They don't need a council of war to share responsibility with if something goes wrong. If something goes wrong, they know where the responsibility rests. It is with them and only with them. They lead by a kind of personal example. These things can be very subtle, but again, in management, they're very important. Lee eats almost the same food that his soldiers have, which means by 1864, sometimes he eats next to nothing. He's very conscious of this. In fact, his staff officers make, kind of make fun of him. There he is performing for the soldiers again. But Lee understood that it was important for his soldiers to see that just because he was the general, he was not living much better than they were. A, uh, try this sometime. A uh, frequent meal for Robert E. Lee was a pone of cornbread, a half a cabbage, and some bacon grease poured over the top of it. Yum, yum. Mm -hmm. And that's about what some of his soldiers were getting at some time. If he was given a nice dish of meat, he would send it out to his staff officers to eat, or just send it out to some of his soldiers, and did it rather publicly, so that it was known he was not living better than they were. Grant does sort of the same thing in a different way. <coughs> when you're commanding an army, and you're, in a, you're an occupier, in enemy territory, you can pretty much take over any house you want as your headquarters. And a lot of generals on both sides would take over the nicest house they could find in the neighborhood, especially if it had a well-stocked wine cellar and a lot of smoked hams out in the outbuildings. Grant will stay in his own tent with the rest of his officers with a tripod camp table, a folding camp chair, and a rickety iron bed. Almost the same kind of bed that Lee slept in. He does have a tent, which is more than some of his soldiers have, but it's very evident that the general in command is not living in luxury. <coughs> Excuse me. They, keep, they have a good eye for subordinates, which is essential in the manager. In this instance, Lee is sometimes better than Grant. Grant now and then will make a poor choice. He'll especially do this when he's president and chooses a couple of cabinet officers. But when they find a good subordinate, they stand behind him and they support him. If something goes wrong for the subordinate, they don't leave him holding the bag. They accept responsibility as partly their own as well. They have different ways of dealing with crises. I spent was a 21 years in editorial management in the publishing industry. And I know that what a manager says whenever something goes wrong is, he did it. <laughs> they don't. And if there's a problem subordinate, someone who's not performing, they will both be patient to a point. But then they diverge. It's interesting. Grant is not a confrontational man, but he has no problem whatever with confrontation. And if someone's not performing well, he will call a man to his, his office and say, you've not done well, leave the army. You're done, Parker. Or he'll transfer him somewhere else if he wants to go elsewhere. But he deals with the problem directly and frontally, and most important, not in front of others. If you have to discipline or dismiss a person that's bad enough, you don't humiliate them by doing it in the presence of others. Lee has a somewhat different temperament. He does not like confrontation. Throughout his entire life, he shies away from face-to-face -face uh, confrontation. But what happens in Lee's army is uh, if a general disappoints him too often, one day the army wakes up and that general's not there anymore. <laughs> Lee has asked Richmond to transfer that general somewhere else. Now, that has solved Lee's problem, but what has it done? 
It's put that made that somebody else's problem. Which is not the most effective way to deal with this, but that's a matter of Lee's personality. That's how he dealt with crises. That's how he dealt with, with conflict. <coughs> they plan carefully, and then they communicate those plans ably. In this instance, Grant is probably a bit better at it than Lee. We were talking uh, over dinner this evening about the issue of orthography and grammar, spelling, and that sort of thing, and differences in writing style. But Grant was, to say the least, an idiosyncratic speller. I mean, some of his words were really good. But you knew what he meant. And his words appear in sentences of four and five and six words with no wasted words. He doesn't waste time on adjectives and adverbs. He speaks directly to the point. It's very difficult for any subordinate to mistake what Grant once done in one of his orders. This, by the way, this business of writing orders is one of the reasons that some of history's best writers have been successful generals. Because their experience has been in communicating succinctly and accurately their intent to their subordinates. And it's not difficult to translate that into writing their story for a general readership. Lee is rather wordy. Too many adjectives. Too many adverbs. Too many qualifiers. Grant says, do this. Lee will say, do this if practicable. A word we no longer use. But again, you know, sort of, if you can. Well, that, that gives the timid commander a back door. As a result of which, some of Lee's orders were miscarried or being misunderstood, which rarely happens with Grant. <clears throat> How are they in action? When the, the bullets are flying, the battle is roaring. Both men are remarkably calm. It, it just amazes the hell out of me now how anybody is calm in that kind of hell. Uh, you can't hear anything. You can't see much of anything. Picture this, which nobody thinks about in relation to the Civil War or in relation to military affairs in general. If you were, say, Robert E. Lee, at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863, you have a, a, a line, a military line of soldiers about four miles long. There's no point on that battlefield where Lee can see his entire army. So how does he know what's going on out of sight? He knows, you need a computer to do this. He knows it because he's getting periodic reports from the left, and from the right saying that when this writer left there 15 minutes ago, this is what was happening. Lee takes reports like this that are 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, up to an hour old, and then has to process them in his brain to come up with a picture of exactly what the battle line looks like at this moment. Ask yourself if you could do that. Every Civil War commander who's successful has to be able to do that. Lee is masterful at it. Grant is masterful at it. As I said, it would take a computer to do that today, and especially when it's so hard to see what's going on. Civil War ordnance and weapons were used, fired with something called black powder, which is sulfur and charcoal and uh, uh, saltpeter. It just makes billows of dense smoke that's heavy and hangs low to the ground. This is one of the reasons flags were important. You can sometimes see a flag sticking up above the cloud of smoke, and that told you where somebody was. It's one of the reasons bugles and drums are important. You can't see, but maybe through all that smoke, you can hear where somebody is. How do you communicate orders in that kind of situation? How do you manage that? Somehow, these men manage to do exactly what and they do it by being bold, by being quick thinking, and by being decisive. One of the things that separates these two from most of their contemporaries is that they are willing to take a big gamble 
if there's the promise of a big result, if successful. Yet they're not rash. Probably the one campaign that Lee is more, and I hasten to add, I'm not a military historian, so everything I've said is just nonsense. <laughs> Probably the one campaign Lee is the most criticized for <clears throat> is the Gettysburg campaign. Because if he suffered such great losses. But look at what his actual goals were. He, it was an enormous risk. His real goal was not to go into Pennsylvania and capture Pennsylvania. It's, only, it's a raid from the beginning to end. He has no notion that the Confederacy is suddenly going to make a safe place to Harrisburg. I mean, yeah, they have good beer. But beyond that, there's no reason that the Confederacy needs to try to take Pennsylvania. It's impossible. His real goals are to seize the initiative in the Eastern Theater of the War, to take the initiative out of the Union's hands, to wrong foot, that is to upset any plans his Union counterpart, General Lee, has for a summer campaign in Virginia, to keep a Union army out of Virginia so that Virginians can gather their own harvests, so that they can rest and refit and resupply and reman his army, and it's to be hoped, while in Pennsylvania, gain a significant victory, knowing he'll still have to retire back to retreat back to Virginia. But a big victory on northern soil will send a big message all across the all across the north, a shockwave that we've been beaten on our own ground, which can have repercussions in places like Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, where there are large factions of people opposed to the war. And it may have repercussions abroad, where the Confederates always have hope, it's pretty much a vain hope, but they still have a hope that perhaps England, or France, or some other European power might grant them diplomatic recognition and follow that up with military aid, just the way the French did in our revolution. And Lee achieves all of those goals, except the big victory. He does send a lightning shock through the North. The North is terrified. Troops are diverted from several points all across the North, from the Mississippi to New York, to rush troops toward Pennsylvania because of the fear that Lee might then take Washington and Baltimore. George G. Meade abandons all plans he had for a summer campaign in Virginia. Virginia is spared a summer without invasion. The Gettysburg campaign is about 75% successful. It came at a terrible cost, but was it a rash gamble? <clears throat> and there's something else about these two men. What happens time after time in action if an army commander is taken by surprise? The enemy <clears throat> attacks him before he's ready, or he didn't expect it. Uh, my late grandfather was a career military officer. He always maintained there are two kinds of generals. There are those who are surprised, and there are those who lie. <laughs> Everybody's going to get surprised sooner or later. Grant and Lee are both taken by surprise multiple times. Because they're always operating on their best guess and best estimate. Most commanders get surprised. Or if they encounter a setback, what will they do? They say, well, this isn't the time or place to fight. They'll retreat fall back along their line of communications toward Richmond or toward Washington to rebuild and rethink and maybe in six weeks or eight weeks or six months if you're George McClellan, maybe try another campaign. When Grant and Lee are taken by surprise, they have exactly, precisely the same reaction. Damn, that's not good. How do I turn this to my advantage? They'll stand their ground and then respond. And generally, they'll respond successfully. They can stay cool in the most difficult of circumstances. And they're both persistent. And they have something else that Napoleon thought was essential in a general. They're lucky. <laughs> I mean, you can't manufacture luck, you can't count on luck, but luck is sort of a tangible thing. Some people are lucky, and some aren't. 
And if you're born with the name Car uh, Kardashian, you're screwed for life. <laughs> Grant and we are unlucky. But they know how to make their own luck. They are largely lucky in the fact that for the first three years of the war, each of them faced this very inferior enemy camp opposing commanders. Lee faces one, <clears throat> I'm being hyperbolic by saying incompetent, he faces one very unsatisfactory general after another in the East until finally he comes up against Meade and then Grant. Grant faces some of the worst people the Confederacy ever put in uniform out in the Western theater of the war until 1864 when he's sent east to face Lee. They're lucky that they were able to build their experience, to build their fund of, of, of imagination and insight and their experience for two or three years before they had to go into the daytime and face each other. And it's interesting to note, Grant is the first one of these two to become a hero. He becomes a hero in the North in February 1862 with the battle at uh, Fort Donaldson, where he captures Fort Donaldson and essentially begins cutting the Confederacy in two. Lee's still a desk soldier at that point. Lee won't become a hero until June, July of 1862 in the Seven Days Campaign, but sort of at the last minute he's put in command of what he calls the Army of Northern Virginia and he electrifies the South and the North together. <coughs> They've had time to grow, but the moment they become heroes, northern and southern public opinion starts to form around them, the southern and northern press starts to turn its attention on them, and by 1863, it is assumed, indeed expected, north and south, that someday these two have to meet. While Grant's still trying to take Vicksburg, while Lee, uh, uh, Lee is still uh, on the way to Gettysburg, People are assuming someday these two have got to go up against each other. There's this sense of inevitability about them. Then there's their view of peace. This war has been fought between them 150 years ago on April 9th. They'll come together and end the war in Virginia. At least, though, don't, you know, don't follow the common mistake and think that Appomattox ended the war. It did not. There are other armies around. It went on until May in North Carolina. The CSS Shenandoah, a Confederate commerce raider, was taking Union vessels as late as November 1865 when the war got over for five months. They just didn't know it. And when they found out, they were in some panic. <laughs> they went all around the world trying to find, trying to get to a British port before a Union vessel might catch up. But even before that the war is over, 150 years ago right now, both of them are thinking about the peace to come. What kind of a peace is it going to be? Lee's a prag fairly pragmatic man. He never says this exactly, but my guess is that by the fall of 1864, he realizes that without a miracle, uh, if Abraham Lincoln is re-elected president, and the northern people are willing to stay the course of this thing, it's almost inevitable that the South is not going to prevail. And he's actually thinking that fall, what sort of a peace can we have? I've told you Jefferson Davis was not a popular president in the South. By December of 1864, there was a small movement to remove him from office by impeachment, and if not by impeachment, then by force. One Confederate senator will actually say, if Jefferson Davis is a, you know, removed or killed, we are sunk. Lee actually will meet with some of these malcontents <coughs> to discuss what kind of a peace can we hope for. If we can't win, maybe we could not lose too badly. Then they realize that they still have bargaining power. If we lay down our arms as a nation, we could give them all the lives that would be lost defeating us to the last man. We can save the Union all of the millions in treasure they will not have to spend to keep their armies in the field, running us down. They have a lot to bargain with, and what Lee's hope, among others, along with others, is that perhaps any reconstruction will be easier, more lenient, that perhaps their civil rights will not be interfered with, 
rights of property, won't get interfered with, though they realize slavery's done. Yeah. It's history. In short, they have something to negotiate with. And what happens in Appomattox? <clears throat> On April 9th, there's some banter back and forth and correspondence beforehand as Lee's kind of fainting. F-E-I-N-T, I-N-T, not F-A-I-N-T. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> trying to see if Grant is at all amenable to some talk about something other than just the surrender of his army. Because he hopes maybe he can get some better terms out of it. Grant has no authority from Lincoln to do anything but take the surrender of Lee's army. They meet April 9th. Lee surrenders. The next day, Grant asks Lee for a meeting. The two of them ride out from their respective lines on horseback. They meet between the lines. They never get off their horses. We don't have a good account of what they talked about. But for about half an hour, apparently, what they spoke of was Grant opened them. The discussion by saying, we've taken care of these ar this army here, but you are not just general commanding the Army of Northern Virginia, you are general in chief of all Confederate armies. You have the authority to command all soldiers everywhere to lay down their arms. We can end this now. And Lee kind of hedges. Then according to a friend of Lee's who got this story from Lee, what Grant may have proposed was that Lee come and meet with Abraham Lincoln and work out terms between the two of them. We don't know if that happened or not. But the point is, it's not necessarily over when it's over. There's still about 100,000 Confederate soldiers under arms across the South. There's still something to bargain with. Lee decides that he can't do that, <clears throat> of course. And as a result, what happens is he just, he just goes home. But even up to after Appomattox, they're still talking about what kind of peace can we have. What Lee really wants is a return, what many Confederates want, is a return to the Union they had before they seceded. Secession didn't work. Let's go back to the way things were. Well, that's not going to work. The North's not going to allow that. Lee wants to rebuild the South, but he wants the South not to be militarily occupied in the Reconstruction. He wants the North to stay out of the South. He wants Southerners to be allowed to continue to manage and govern their own institutions and govern themselves, allowing for the fact that slavery is over. But he really doesn't take into account the fact that there are now going to be these four million freed slaves in the former Confederate states. And they don't much enter into his thinking. What Grant wants is what Lincoln wanted which is a reunification, preferably without military occupation, the full implementation of the 13th and then the 14th Amendments to the Constitution, and by the time he is president, the full implementation of the 15th Amendment as well. He wants full rights of citizenship, full voting rights, full rights to own property, to govern their lives for the former slaves. That gets wrapped up in Reconstruction politics, which is so depressing, I don't even get into it. <laughs> and of course, it's not going to happen. They will meet one last time, and it's an always interesting way to discuss peace. Grant's elected president in 1868, he takes office in March 1869. And as soon as he takes office, he sends through an intermediary an invitation to leave to come and call on him at the White House, which Lee accepts. And Lee sort of approaches by a very indirect route so as to attract as little attention as possible. And he arrives at the White House, I think it's April 5th, so Grant's only been president for a, a month, and sort of comes in a side door to attract very little notice and sends in his car and says, Robert E. Lee. <clears throat> Grant is meeting with several senators, sees the card, and says, well, Senators, you've all got to get out of here. I want to talk to General Lee. You've got some very, very unhappy Yankee Senators. They're being kicked out of the President's office because of this General Lee. They have a brief and not very comfortable discussion. But the gist of it is that Grant is hoping that Lee would join with him in pressing and supporting a gubernatorial candidate in Virginia and a new constitution for Virginia that, if approved, would, would sort of short-circuit 
the need for military reconstruction in Virginia. Lee backs away from any political involvement, even though he supports both, both the gubernatorial candidate and the uh, Constitution. And that's the last time they meet. Lee, of course, will die just a year and a half later. Grant, of course, will live for some time afterward. Neither one of them will get the peace that he wanted. They each get sort of a piece of a piece, but not the whole eye. Yet what it shows to the end is the decisive nature, the incisive nature of two men who can see through all the muck to the central issue at hand and try to address it, perhaps by a different ways, perhaps not successfully, but always with an eye toward what, in their view, was the good of the country they were serving. Thank you all for listening. these generals' approach to foreign diplomacy, I'm thinking particularly of Britain's diplomatic presence in the war, uh, what was Lee's expectation with regards to Great Britain, um, and what was Grant's expectation? The uh, <clears throat> question is about what were their expectations about for possible foreign intervention in the war. Uh, Lee had hopes. <coughs> I don't think he ever had expectations. Uh, even Jefferson Davis himself said that you know, European nations helping us is going to be like going to a bank and asking for a loan. They'll give you the loan if you can demonstrate that you don't need the money. <laughs> Europe, there was, Europe had nothing to gain from getting involved in this. And Europe means England. What England does, other nations will do. And the United States Union has built the largest, most modern war fleet on the, on the globe, a tremendous threat to the British carrying trade and its dominance in the world. Britain had nothing to gain from going to war with uh, the Union. Uh, and I think Jefferson Davis certainly understood that. Lee's quiet about expectations. He had hopes of influencing. And Grant is silent altogether. Grant's focused on the job in front of him. I'm a general. Diplomacy is not my department. Did Grant drink as much as some say he did? Did Grant drink as much as some say he did? Why do I always get that question? <laughs> no. Uh, Grant did drink occasionally, and Grant was a cheap drunk. He had, his system had a relatively low metabolism in, in processing uh, alcohol, so that three or four drinks in Grant would get pretty silly. But he was not an alcoholic. We have, there are about four definite times in the war when we have direct contemporaneous eyewitness evidence but Grant got drunk. When he did, he went to bed, woke up the next morning with no hangover, and got right back to work. He shows none of the classic signs of alcoholism. What got Grant his reputation, again, is politics. I told you he didn't, he, he, he was not afraid of confrontation. He arrested a couple of officers who weren't doing their job in 1862. He arrested a man, a steamboat captain, 
who didn't like that very much, so the steamboat captain started spreading false stories about Grant being a drunk. My favorite is one in which Grant is in a hotel in St. Louis, so stinking drunk, he can't walk, and he crawls on all fours like an animal up the staircase to get to his room. It's pure nonsense. But this fellow was the protege of one of those politicians I was telling you about, General John McClernand, who adopts this man, and between the two, they get the anti-Lincoln press spreading these stories, and suddenly across the nation, that's a drunk. He knows how to control it when he does drink. He's usually, at his best, he's staying away from it if his wife Julia is with him. She's his touchstone. She, she keeps it centered. But as I said, there's only four or five examples. And there are many, many instances in which Grant could have a glass of wine or two, then walk away from it. It's not a case of like he had one drink and had to have it. Yes? Um, <clears throat> during Gettysburg, uh, Grant, uh, Lee, towards the end of the battle, seemed to have made a very foolish decision to attack uphill. And I think that was what uh, uh, lost the, the, the whole campaign for him. And I never found a, a logical reason why he decided to do that. Unless in the back of his mind he was thinking, it's time to just roll the dice and either uh, prevail or end this. You're, you're talking about July 3rd, Longstreet's assault for a picket's charge, as it's, as it's usually called. Uh, remember what I was saying about the Gettysburg campaign. Lee's already achieved several of his goals in that campaign. He hadn't achieved the big victory he had hoped to get. He had tried to attack the Union line on its left and failed. He tried to attack on its right, and he failed. That, he figured, not wisely apparently, that it might be Union line might be weak in his center. And he had a very good plan for doing it. But it was extremely risky. But frontal assaults did occasionally work in that war. He also had his cavalry commander, Jeb Stuart, under orders to hit the rear of the center of the Union line at the same time that Lee hit the front of the center, to pinch it between the two. Now, Stuart never got anywhere close. But just consider what if it had worked. It would be regarded as one of the bravest, most bold, most daring, and most successful maneuvers in military history. It didn't work, so it, you know, it goes down as Lee's failure. And it is Lee's. It was his order to do so. I don't think he ever regret, well, I know he regretted giving the order, but I, I think it was the only thing he could think to do as one last effort to pull somehow a victory out of this battle to make his whole campaign you know, a, a holistic success. And even then, when it did fail, he spent July 4th staying in his lines on the battlefield without retreating. He's still, it's that moment of, this hasn't gone well, is there still something I can do to turn this around? It's only after a full day, just staring at the Yankees, that Lee decides to retreat. Yes? That was very interesting that you said at West Point they really didn't teach military strategy. So where did uh, commanders in that time period get their uh, strategies, where did they learn tactics and so forth? How did they, how did they make up for that? What little they got in the way of, of tactics, they got from reading, and the book that most of them read was uh, Antoine Jomini's, I've forgotten the exact title. The, the French were the military models of the world at that time, so figure. <laughs> uh, and Jomini was virtually the Bible for soldiers. Even if it wasn't taught in class, they would buy it and read it anyhow. It was then translated by uh, a confederate, a future confederate, William J. Hardee. It was called Hardee's Tactics. And General Winfield Scott, who commanded the U.S. Army, also did a version of it known as Scott's Tactics. So what they got at all, they got from reading these tactical books and reading a military history. Every one of these guys read Napoleon's memoirs. So that was still sort of the, the dominant military thing. But other than that, it was a case of earn while you learn go out and do it and, and get the experience. Yes, which of these two men do you enjoy reading about more? Uh, which of the two do I enjoy reading about more? <clears throat> I'm not sure that, that I see it, that there's a difference between them. They're fairly different guys in many ways, but I find them both very interesting. Uh, I feel kind of sorry for Lee uh, in that in his personal life, he did not have a very happy personal life. Grant had a wonderfully happy person. 
there's a great deal in Lee's career to admire. I mean, this is, this is the man who gave up everything for what it was he, he believed was his duty. To do Lee was, was originally, duty was not just a totem to him, it was almost a fetish. He was, he was obsessed with this concept of duty from a very early age. He had, a, he had a, not a very happy childhood, and duty was, was a big part of what got him through. Uh, Grant's quite the opposite. He's a pretty happy-go-lucky fellow. He encounters a lot of hardship in his life, but he's always an optimist. So they're so different in their, in their personalities. Their professional characteristics are almost identical, but their personalities are so different that it's equally interesting to read about both of them because there's always that contrast. A little follow-up on that. If you had the chance to meet these two people, <laughs> what question would you ask them first? Uh, we just discussed this a little bit at dinner. If I could have dinner with either one of them, I'd have dinner with Grant, because Grant's more approachable. Uh, he's pretty much a case of what you see is what you get. There's very little sham. Uh, Grant's very open, perhaps too open for his own good. Uh, Lee is so closely guarded that at the end of the evening with him, I don't think I would know anything that I didn't know already. What would I ask of him? Grant, I like Grant among other things because he once owned a pool hall. <laughs> in San Francisco, Grant was a partner in a pool hall in 1850. And apparently he was pretty damn hand with a cue himself. I would ask Grant what, what variety of pool he liked to play. <laughs> what would I ask Lee? There's a host of mysteries about me, of things that he kept closely guarded and to himself. I'd really like to ask him if he'd open up about his father. His father's the great hero of the revolution, Light Horse Harry Lee. A uh, wonderful general, a great man in wartime, a disaster in peace. He bankrupted himself, he wound up spending time in debtor's prison, he eventually just abandons his family. But Robert E. Lee was seven years old at the time, and he never sees his father again. <clears throat> There's always within Lee, you can see it now and then, this desire to know more about his father, and somehow to find a father he can be yeah, I know he's proud of his Revolutionary War service, but I think a father he could be proud of as a father, which, which he didn't get. His uh, father tried to come back to the United States and died just after he reached the South Carolina coast. He's buried just outside Savannah now. When Lee was in command in Savannah as an engineer, he made one visit to his father's grave and wrote a letter to his wife in which he said, I visited my father's grave, this is what it says on the stone. And then he goes on to describe the orange grove. That's all he's got to say about his father. I'd like to know what he was really thinking about life was here to be and how much, who knows how much that impacted his own obsession with duty and his desire, I think, to make up for the embarrassment that his father made of the town. Whenever Lee go to any length to uh, address the question of the constitutionality of secession, question is, did Grant or Lee, either one, go to any length uh, to justify the, or talk about the concept, the concept of the justification of secession? Uh, Grant thought it simply didn't exist. It was not law. The Constitution doesn't say you can pull out if you want to, therefore you can't. Lee, as, uh, Lee thought the secessionists were nuts. One, one area where they both agree is that the crisis has been brought on by fanatics on both extremes. Abolitionists on the one hand, and the hardcore uh, fiery secessionists on the other. They both deplored these people. But the fact is they brought on this crisis nevertheless. And Lee seems to have believed there was at least an intrinsic right of secession, though it was unwise. It's interesting, if you read his letters <coughs> to his wife and his few other confidants, as late as early 1862, Lee will still once or twice refer to our unhappy country, not just talking about the South. And in late 1861, the war's been going for some months, you'll find a couple of occasions in which Lee will utter or write expressions that sound sort of like, if we can just smooth this over and adjust this thing, we can go back to the way things were. 
he doesn't say it, but I think it's implicit in that, that he means a reunited union. If Congress and Washington would give guarantees to the, the southern states of their rights and property and slaves and the other issues that were driving them, then he felt perhaps the South would, would go back with the North. There's a big chunk of the southern population who felt that they were called cooperation. Okay, well thank you all very much.